Hi, right, everybody. I see a few people are here. I'm just going to wait a few minutes to start the introductions before uh, or, or while sort of the, the crowd joins. Still see a lot of people coming on to the meeting, so it'll just take a few minutes. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining in. Just waiting for the, the people that continue to um, log on to get onto the Zoom session, and then we'll begin in just a minute. Let's invite them all to Hawaii. Nice. <laughs> I like that even as well as the bubbles. Or do you prefer this? That's good, too. Well, that's a little too. <laughs> Cannabis. -y. Right. I think we can get started. I, I see that the number of participants continuing to join has sort of leveled off. So hi, everybody. My name is Jeff Smith, and I'm the interim director of the Institute of Cannabis Research, which is hosted at Colorado State University Pueblo. Welcome to our webinar series, which is presented by the ICR and the Lambert Center for the Study of Medicinal Cannabis and Hemp at Thomas Jefferson University. The webinar series in collaboration with the Lambert Center is one of the many ways that the ICR works to promote the dissemination of cannabis research. For example, please see our website, which you can easily find by Googling the words Institute of Cannabis Research. From there, you can navigate to our outreach tab. You can find our current e-newsletter. You can go to the research tab and view summaries of each of the research projects that the ICR currently funds. We're happy to report having received a record number of applications for new research funding in the next fiscal year. And these applications, which came from a variety of the finest academic research institutions in Colorado, are currently under review by our panel of scientific experts. You can also find information about future monthly webinars on the website. Additionally, note the link to the Journal of Cannabis Research, which the ICR sponsors. The journal is published by prestigious Springer Nature and is always looking for both high quality scientific article submissions and reviewers. Finally, we'll be hosting the ICR's seventh annual Cannabis Research Conference next August in beautiful Denver, Colorado, and we are very happy to announce a program of a full three days of cannabis research will be presented at the conference, including keynote presentations from, among others, Dr. Esther Shohami, who was personally selected to deliver the Meshulam Lecture by the father of cannabis research, Dr. Raphael Meshulam. He made this selection shortly before he passed away this spring. Registration is open, so please find the conference link on our website and register for our conference and come learn about the very best current cannabis science in the world. Additional information about the ICR is also available on our website, so please visit us. Okay, before we get started with the presentation, I'd like to just mention some logistical items for the webinar. The presentation will be followed by a short question and answer period. To ask a question, please do so using the Q&A feature in the Zoom toolbar. You can enter questions at any time during the presentation. We will address as many questions as time allows at the end of the hour. Second, please reserve the chat function in Zoom for technical issues and questions about technical issues. Both the Q&A and chat functions are in the, the toolbar on your Zoom screen. It's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Ruth Charbonneau, the Associate Director of the Lambert Center, who will be introducing today's presenter and moderating the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I'm pleased today that we have Reinhold Penner, uh, MD, PhD, 
He is a world-renowned ion channel expert at the Center for Biomedical Research at the Queen's Medical Center in Honolulu, Hawaii. Prior to joining the Queen's Medical Center in 1997, Dr. Penner worked at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in Germany with Nobel laureate Irvin Nehar. Currently, his group is now involved in drug discovery efforts for a range of ion channels involved in infl inflammation and immune diseases, pain, diabetes, and cancer. Um, I urge all of you to read his for his talk. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Penner. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I am a relative newcomer uh, to the field of cannabis, and uh, my main interest has been on signal transduction, ion channels, uh, how calcium signaling shapes the behavior of cells, both in physiology as well as in pathology. And what I'll try to do today is share some of the data that we have recently acquired uh, using cannabinoids as modulators of calcium signaling and inflammation. So uh, as, uh, as, as was already mentioned, I am uh, presently at the Queens Medical Center, which is the largest hospital in the, in the Pacific. Uh, it, uh, uh, it, it partners with the University of Hawaii. So I have uh, uh, multiple appointments. I'm a faculty at the University of Hawaii Medical School as well as the Cancer Center. Uh, right now, I do not have any uh, conflicts to disclose other than some of the data that I'm presenting uh, have been filed for patent protection by our institution. So, as I mentioned, we are coming from Hawaii and living on an island really exposes us to a number of interesting uh, natural environments. These include Palm trees, the areca palm, for example, is very abundant on our islands. Uh, in fact, one of these areca palms is in my backyard. And uh, we are studying some of the molecules contained in these uh, uh, beetle nuts. These are uh, coming from the areca palm. And we have looked at their ability to induce oral cancer. Uh, we have also looked at um, ways to uh, combat cancer, to develop anti-cancer uh, drugs, uh, which we find in the ocean uh, right next to our beaches, uh, where we have discovered soft corals uh, that contain molecules called ricinicin A, uh, which have uh, important function in stroke, cancer, and kidney disease. Finally, we have also studied uh, some molecules that came from a marine sponge, scleridyl, which inhibits an ion channel called TRIP-M2, which is very important for neurodegeneration and atherosclerosis. But today, uh, I will be talking about cannabis, and this is our most recent endeavor. Uh, cannabis, uh, as you know, uh, is an interesting plant that contains a number of molecules, cannabinoids, as well as other molecules, and they work in multiple ways. So they, they regulate inflammation, pain, cancer, and kidney disease. And in our lab, we are interested in trying to understand how cannabis may work in, in these diseases. And these are the focus points that we are pursuing here. We are trying to essentially uh, mimic the plant or molecules within the plant, but make them available uh, for medical or pharmaceutical use, which is much more defined than, say, a plant extract. And the, the, the main indications that we are pursuing are cancer, autoimmune disorders, pain, neurodegeneration, and kidney disease. And all of these diseases are so varied, and people are sometimes wondering, is it really true that cannabis can affect all of these diseases uh, and be good for all of them? And I think that one of the answers or one possible connection between all of them is that 
most of the human diseases really have a component that uh, relates to inflammation. And so inflammation is a process that is physiologically very important because our immune system needs to combat external stimuli that uh, can have adverse effects, allergic reactions, infections, burns, wounds, chemicals that we're exposed to. And this leads to uh, a, a very well-defined and orchestrated uh, play of both uh, uh, innate and immune uh, and adaptive immune system cells to try and fix the problem. And this involves the activation of mast cells, the activation of PMNs, of lymphocytes, monocytes, macrophages, etc. This is a well orchestrated uh, process that hopefully will remedy uh, the insult that was experienced. Unfortunately, in many cases, uh, this uh, acute inflammation cannot be resolved because it's either too much or because uh, the, the the immune system uh, derails a little bit. And this leads to the persistent activation and chronic inflammation. And this chronic inflammation now plays an important role in practically all uh, disease uh, manifestations in humans. These can be cardiovascular or neurological. They can be cancer. They can be arthritis, autoimmune, et cetera. And because these immune cells are so important, uh, one of the goals of our lab is to try and understand how they function and how they actually produce the signaling molecules that uh, make them interact with each other and uh, create the uh, inflammatory response. And the most important part of this in many immune cells is that they use calcium signaling as a pathway uh, to be activated and produce the responses that they uh, that they need in order to create both acute but also chronic inflammation. So when we are looking at an immune cell, uh, one has to consider that calcium outside is very high. It's at one millimolar physiologically, and the calcium inside the cell is fairly low at 0.1 micromolar. And that creates a 10,000 fold gradient for calcium trying to get into the cell uh, because of the large chemical gradient that is 10,000 fold. And it can normally not penetrate the plasma membrane, but it might be activated if ion channels open. And these ion channels can be receptor operated or voltage operated or second messenger operated or even store operated. And this is where our lab uh, has its interest in. Uh, we are interested in understanding how ion channels function to regulate intracellular calcium to activate a number of uh, processes that are uh, critical for immune cell function. All right, so now this is a very complicated slide and I'm not going to go into great detail of this, but remember that the outside of the cell has very high calcium, and the inside has normally very low calcium. And there are these ion channels, and there's quite a plethora of these ion channels that are found in immune cells that can open up depending on receiving the, the appropriate stimulus. And when this calcium goes up, it leads to the activation of a number of important signaling pathways that can either lead to pain via phospholipase A2, uh, cyclooxygenases or lipoxygenases. They can lead to the activation of calmodulin and pathways that lead to the uh, uh, translocation of uh, transcription factors that ultimately lead to the production of inflammatory cytokines, cell proliferation, fibrotic responses. So many of these ion channels have been suggested to be targets of cannabinoids. And in our lab, we have all of these ion channels at our disposal in heterologous overexpression systems so that we can study them in isolation and see how they respond to various uh, natural products that we uh, add to them. You may have already uh, known or, or heard about uh, signal transduction pathways that are uh, triggered by endocannabinoids, such as, for example, anandamide. Uh, these act on CB1, cannabinoid receptor 1, or cannabinoid receptor 2, 
There's also serotonin receptors, and these mostly signal through G proteins to activate kinase, uh, uh, adenylate cyclases, which then lead to the activation of kinases such as protein kinase C or inhibition of kinases like a protein kinase A. But there are other more recently discovered G proteins that are considered orphan proteins, and these couple through GQ, and they may uh, be act activated by unknown agonists so far, but they may be important for cannabinoid signaling via phospholipase C, production of IP3, and release of calcium from internal stores. Now, one of the mechanisms that I would like you to focus on is this one. And this mechanism is really uh, very close and dear to my lab's heart because this is the mechanism that was discovered in my lab. And that is the so-called store-operated calcium entry mechanism via uh, channels that are activated uh, by the release of calcium from internal stores. So we coined the term crack channels or calcium release activated calcium channels. These channels are activated uh, when the endoplasmic reticulum is uh, releasing calcium, and this can be through mechanisms like IP3 production, uh, which then uh, triggers these uh, so-called uh, calcium sensors, STEM1 and STEM2. So these normally, if the ER is full, will bind calcium and remain inactive. But if the calcium leaves, this calcium disappears from the binding site of these molecules, and then they couple to these channels in the plasma membrane to let a lot of calcium into the cell and trigger the immune response. Once that is accomplished, this calcium then can lead to the activation of calmodulin, calcineurin, which is a calcium-dependent phosphatase, and that leads to the translocation of the nuclear factor for activated T cells, which then triggers the production of cytokines such as IL-2 and cell proliferation. This mechanism, interestingly enough, has not really been studied in the context of cannabinoids. So we said, how could this be? How can this very important mechanism for inflammation not have been studied? Well, good for us because uh, when we did this and we obtained some interesting data that I'm going to present to you, uh, that led to uh, a very nice uh, grant that we received from the NIH to study this particular mechanism, as well as uh, the others that are depicted here. So the way we do this is we either use phenotype-based uh, screening systems. So these are, for example, mast cells or T cells or B cells or monocytes or macrophages or microglia, or any other immune cells that are relevant for uh, the immune response, the inflammatory immune response. And uh, alternatively, we can also use heterologous expression system where we selectively express ion channels, like for example, the TRIP channels that you see uh, uh, named here, TRIP-M3, uh, TRIP-M7, TRIP-M8, et cetera. And these can all be studied in 96 well or 384, uh, well, plates, and we can follow calcium signaling inside these cells. So if the calcium goes up, we can measure this in these high throughput screening systems. And let me show you what this looks like. So these are traces that we obtain with the calcium indicator. So we use a cell, in this case, these are T cells that we load with the calcium indicator dye, and then we stimulate them. And then in some cases, we, or in most cases, we see an increase in calcium if we use the appropriate stimulus. And in other cases, we can block this with particular doses of, of uh, cannabinoids, for example, and I'll show you the data for that. So when we're studying uh, cannabis, obviously the major class of molecules found in cannabis sativa are natural cannabinoids that uh, are present in the plant in the raw form of CBGA, which is the mother uh, of all cannabinoids, um, which can uh, then be processed by various enzymes within the plant to produce molecules like THCA, CBDA, or CBCA. And these uh, molecules in the raw form are all non-psychoactive. Uh, these molecules are present 
just in the plant as it is. But once they are heated, so if you smoke them or if you heat them uh, by baking a brownie or something like that, uh, they will lose this acidic portion that is attached to them in THCA and then will then what we call decarboxylate and produce molecules like THC, CBD, CBC, et cetera. And uh, you probably know these, THC and CBD, which are the two main uh, cannabinoids found in the cannabis plant. But all of these are found to some small degrees in the cannabis plant. And if you age it, you obtain these, and you can also obtain molecules that are metabolized in the body. I'm not going to go into those. But these are the main major and minor uh, cannabinoids that we wanted to study. Uh, but there are other molecules in cannabis that we are also planning to study. And we're not planning to study them uh, just by themselves, but also possibly in combination, because there's this idea of uh, the uh, uh, effect that the plant in, in some is more... Uh, uh, is more effective than the individual molecules. And uh, we are planning to use all of these. And the first part of, uh, of, of our study, which is fairly fresh, we have concentrated on the cannabinoids, but we are also planning to test terpenes, flavonoids, and lignans that are found in these plants. And we do this by using, for example, the phenotypic screens that I already alluded to, where we measure calcium signaling in mast cells, lymphocytes, neutrophils, monocytes, microglia, and fibroblasts. And we also look at cytokine production as the end effect of, uh, of, the, of the phenotypic screen. And once we see that there is an effect, we obviously need to find out, well, what is the mechanism that is engaged uh, that uh, is affected by these cannabinoids. And these can be receptors or G proteins. They can be receptor operated ion channels, second messenger operated channels, store operated channels, as the ones that I have explained to you a minute ago, as well as voltage operated channels. It could also impinge on plasma membrane calcium ATPases, which regulate the removal of calcium from the cytosol into the extracellular space. So in order to study this, we really have to actually get the, the plant material or the compounds. And that is not so easy because you have to get a permit. So for us, we have to get from the state of Hawaii uh, a license to study uh, uh, controlled substances at uh, uh, Schedule 1. We also, once we have the state license, we have to apply for the DEA license to do this. And once we have that, we can go to the University of Mississippi and get the NIDA approved plant material. Uh, so we got all of the plant samples that they have available in different combinations of different amounts of THC and CBD, as well as potentially other cannabinoids. And then luckily we can also have Hawaii hemp, which is free to, to study because hemp is legal as long as it doesn't have enough THC to make it illegal. Uh, and then we can start our experiments. And here's the first experiment. So from NIDA, we have obtained uh, these raw plant material. And what we did is we produced an extract of a plant that was high in THC. So this is uh, the, 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 the plant material that uh, someone would get in order to get a high to, uh, to experience uh, uh, cannabis uh, psychoactive effects, for example. And when we uh, make this extract, we can analyze what's in it. So we have an HPLC system, so we can analyze any and all uh, uh, cannabinoids and find out how much of CBD is in this extract and how much THC is in it. And when we are using this extract at 25 micrograms per ml, we know that the CBD concentration is fairly low, one micromolar, and THC is fairly high, 17 micromolar. And what we then can do is we can do an experiment and want to see, okay, so what happens when we apply the extract or the equivalent amount of uh, CBD 
or the equivalent amount of THC, as well as a uh, uh, positive control, gadolinium. And what you can see in this experiment is we apply first the compound of interest, and then we just wait for uh, three minutes and apply Thapsigargan. Thapsigargan is a molecule that will cause depletion of calcium from the intracellular store. And when that happens, remember, stem one and stem two will lose the calcium that is bound to them. This will activate the crack channels in the plasma membrane, and then you will see this large increase in calcium coming from the outside over some 10 minutes or so. And you can see this is a large calcium signal. This will lead to the activation of T cells. When we then deprive the extracellular environment of calcium uh, by adding EGTA, we can actually bring the calcium back down to baseline levels because there's no further calcium that can go into the cell. So this confirms that this is indeed calcium influx uh, that is induced by the emptying of stores with Tapsigargan. So let's see what happens with the positive control. So gadolinium, we know that gadolinium is not a drug, but it is a molecule, a tool for us to demonstrate that at one micromolar, this response is really due to the activation of store-operated calcium entry. And you can see the green trace, even at rest, there's already a decrease in calcium because there's a basal turnover of calcium. And then when we admit calcium under these experimental conditions, there's no store-operated calcium anymore because gadolinium blocked it. But look at the THC extract. It is also very potent in suppressing this response. So for the first time, we were ecstatic when we saw, oh, wow, store-operated calcium entry that nobody had looked at before seems to be inhibited by the THC extract. Now, what about CBD and THC, or the combination of both, which we know is present in this extract? And you can see that CBD, that's the uh, orange trace here in the back, you can hardly see it because it's right like the control. So CBD at one micromolar has no effect. This is THC. THC also has no effect. And this is the combination of T CBD and THC. And you see it's a minor effect. So there must be something else that causes this effect. And then we said, okay, so let's try another extract. How about a CBD rich, a hemp extract? Oh, I forgot to mention. The reason uh, why THC at 17 micromolar is not very effective is because we can do a dose response curve and show that 17 micromolar really does not have a very strong inhibitory effect on calcium entry uh, in, in, in jerkat T cells. So the IC50 is way above 50 micromolar. So the C THC is a non-effective molecule. So what about the CBD now? Now, CBD uh, also uh, taken from, uh, from the NIDA material, but we can also do this with the Hawaiian hemp material. At 25 micrograms per ml, we determined that CBD was present at 47 micromolar and THC was present at two micromolar. So what happens now is that, uh, again, gadolinium blocks the response, but the CBD extract is even more potent than the THC-rich extract in blocking this response. In fact, it is as potent as uh, gadolinium. So this is the red trace here. What about THC-2 micromolar? THC-2 micromolar, that's the blue trace. It's right here with the control. So 2 micromolar THC. And we knew this already, THC does not inhibit store-operated calcium entry, has no effect. But CBD at 47 micromolar does have an effect. That's the purple trace here. But 47 micromolar is a fairly high dose. And when we're looking at the dose response curve here, you can see 47 micromolar is really a killer dose. It's an industrial dose that it cannot be achieved physiologically, but it will inhibit uh, store-operated calcium entry. But even so, the extract itself is even more potent and CBD cannot account for the full effect here. So what we then did is obviously, we need to look at all of the other molecules. And so here are uh, the number of molecules that I've already alluded to in the other slide. 
Uh, these are the natural ones. CBGA is the mother compound. Then the green ones here, these are the ones that are present in the raw format. These are due to photoconversion. These are the heated molecules. Uh, and some of these are converted molecules. And you can see that uh, all of these are non-psychoactive. The red ones here are psychoactive molecules. So when we do this, here's the dose response curve for all of them. And you can see that many of them will inhibit eventually at high doses, uh, although some do not at all. Uh, but you can see that, uh, that there are uh, the acidic ones, which we typically represent by the blue trace, and CBD, the orange trace. So this is the decar decarboxylated version, 7.4 micromolar, 4.2 micromolar. This is not a very strong inhibitor. These are the most potent ones. So you can see here, this one is 530 nanomolar. CBGA is the most potent cannabinoid we found to inhibit store operated calcium entry uh, below uh, micromolar levels. But there are others at low micromolar, 1.2, 1.1, 1 micromolar. Uh, but in all cases, if you look at the blue versus the orange, so the blue is the uh, acidic version, the orange is the decarboxylated version. In all cases, decarboxylation causes the cannabinoid to lose its potency. All right, so now we wanted to find out what is, what is happening when we combine these molecules. Now, combining these molecules is really interesting and one can use uh, a, a, a method uh, that is called isobolographic analysis. The way this works is, we essentially take the dose response curves of each and every cannabinoid and then determine what is the IC50. Remember for CBGA, the concentration is 530 nanomolar or 0.53 uh, uh, micromolar right here. That's the IC50 for CBGA. If we go lower IC40, IC30, IC20, or IC10, you can see that lower doses will cause a lower efficacy. So this is the IC30, this is the IC10. And then we can plot this against, for example, CBD. Now CBD, remember, had 7.4 micromolar efficacy, IC50. And this is, oh, sorry. And we can now plot the different doses against each other so that the total inhibitory effect should add up to IC50, IC10 plus IC40, also IC50 of the two molecules. So if we combine the different IC values to expect an IC50 or an inhibitory concentration of 50%, uh, that should give us uh, a linear response for all of them because the combination is expected to produce 50% inhibition. And many of the molecules, including CBD, if we mix them uh, at different ratios, really produce a linear response as predicted if they were added, if, if they were just acting independently of each other and inhibiting their portion of the star operated calcium entry. But in some molecules, we see that the combination is more potent than the expected linear effect that we would expect, for example, from 30 IC30 of CBGA plus IC20 plus, uh, in this case, THCA. And you can see that if we uh, put this together, we will see uh, a, a nice uh, synergy in the inhibition or what we call an entourage effect. It's not a strong effect, but it is clearly visible. In other cases, actually, they inhibit each other. So one really has to pay attention to the molecules that one administers and that are present in different plant uh, versions. So we now did the IC50s for all of these molecules and not just in lymphocytes, but we did this in mast cells. These are human mast cells in rat mast cells, in two types of human monocytes, as well as uh, uh, HEC293 cells, which is a human embryonic kidney cell line. Uh, all of these cells do have uh, store-operated calcium entry. 
But you can see there are quite dramatic differences in the efficacy of molecules to inhibit store-operated calcium entries. So remember, CVGA has 0 0.5, 0 0.53 efficacy in GERCAT cells. It is also very potent in, in LUVA cells or mast cells. Here's another molecule, CBNA, very potent in GERCATs, but is not potent in LUVAs at all, and so on. And so the two cell lines that we observe the strongest effects are mast cells and T cells. And this is shown here in the radar plot. And you can see that the more potent uh, efficacy uh, around uh, submicromolar levels or low micromolar levels are in the jerkhead cells and in the LUVA cells. And these are the molecules that we have obtained as the most potent ones, CBGA, CBGVA, CBDA, CBNA, and THCA. Now, because all of these molecules uh, have some degree of specificity, look at these interesting ones. So for example, CBDV is highly, highly potent, 0.2 micromolar, 200 nanomolar IC50 in the mast cells. It is not effective, it's not very effective in, in the lymphocytes. And the same is true for delta-9 THC. So these two have an interesting selectivity for mast cells. Here we have some that are at one micromolar jerkats or lymphocytes, but not effective in any of the others. Or this one here, 1.1, and the rest are not very effective at all. So this allows us to selectively target certain immune cells or combine them to target maybe more than one uh, immune cell. And we are studying other immune cells to see what is the actual pattern of uh, inflammatory immune response efficacy of the various cannabinoids and how can we combine them in order to target different disease states. But why is that? Uh, why is it that some cells can be inhibited uh, whereas others cannot be inhibited even though they all experience this particular type of response, namely store-operated calcium entry? Now, store-operated calcium entry, remember, is triggered by the production of IP3, which will then lead to the release of calcium from the ER, which then leads to the activation of these two sensors. So there's two sensors that then can lead to the activation of the crack channels. But there's not just one crack channel. There are actually three proteins that code for uh, store-operated calcium entry channels. And these are RI1, RI2, and RI3. And they can assemble into monomeric channels. So six of these subunits can produce one crack channel of RI1. These can produce RI2 channels, and these can produce RI3 channels. But making things more complicated and more flexible, actually, these also can produce heteromeric channels. And this may explain why some cells are more susceptible than others in uh, uh, respond, uh, uh, in responding to uh, cannabinoid, uh, cannabinoid uh, inhibition. So we're presently trying to uh, dissect which particular proteins are inhibited by the various cannabinoids, uh, which can then hopefully account for the effect that we observe. Now, we also want to know what is the true activation mechanism. Remember, the, these are the crack channels that we're activating, and we can measure them. We don't really have to rely on the indirect measurement of calcium. We can actually inject IP3 into the cells without a stimulus that is otherwise by using a patch clamp, an electrophysiological needle. So IP3 goes into the cell, releases the calcium. This then leads to the activation of an inward current, and this inward current is carried by calcium ions. You can see this is the current that we activate uh, in response to IP3 or store depletion. And then at this point in time, we apply CBGA to the outside. If we don't apply CBGA, the current remains sustained. This is the control. So the current remains open for as long as we study it. But when we apply CBGA at increasing concentrations, here's 0.3 micromolar, 
this is one micromolar, three micromolar, and 10 micromolar. So there's a dose-dependent inhibition of this uh, so-called CREC current. And this is the dose response curve. So we can demonstrate that 1.3 micromolar of CBGA will block uh, this particular crack current. So we decided, OK, so uh, does it have to be applied outside, or does it block the channel from the inside? And we can test that by injecting not just IP3, but also CBGA in combination. So we apply 10 micromolar uh, internal, that's the blue one. 10 micromolar CBGA should completely block the current if it were effective on the inside. But as you can see, the current remains here. Uh, in, intracellular application of CBGA is ineffective. And then if we come from the outside and apply CBGA, there's a complete block. All right, so now we have determined that actually it is the ion channels that are blocked from the outside. And we then wanted to know, okay, so let's uh, produce another nice figure where we show that this really leads to the activation to, to the inhibition of NFAT. NFAT is the nuclear factor for activated T cells that translocates into the cytosol. And we have a system, we have a cell line that gives us a reporter assay. Uh, to measure the NFAT activation. And to our great dismay and disappointment, none of the cannabinoids really had a major impact on uh, the translocation of NFAT. We were totally frustrated by this. And I think that many of you who do these types of experiments have your own frustration with your own experiments that you predicted should work, but then eventually do not work. And we need to figure out, well, why does this not work? in a system where we're measuring this NFAT translocation. Well, the experiment has to be done differently. It cannot be done within a couple of minutes. We need to measure NFAT over 24 hours in order to detect it. So this has to be done in tissue culture and in medium. Now, medium typically has its issues. And if you're looking at 24 hours, the molecule might break down in medium or the cells may metabolize it. But none of that really was the case. We found out, and I'm not going to go into the various assays that we developed in order to do that, but the reason was that we have to use these cells with serum normally. And normally we use serum in our, uh, in our tissue culture at 10%. And if we apply a stimulus, in this case, the stimulus is a PMA ionomycin, which will lead to the activate to store depletion plus activation of protein kinase C. This leads to a massive increase in NFAT luciferase activity. So this works really fine. This is due to store operated calcium entry. And at 10%, there's no effect of CBGA. Even at 5% serum, there is still no effect of CBGA. We really have to go to 1%. And now a CBGA, the same concentration, 5 micromolar, starts to block really nicely. In the absence of serum, there's a complete block. So this is one of the problems that we are, and not just us, are facing presently in this field because cannabinoids bind to BSA. And we have to uh, then do experiments in the absence of serum right now. And under these conditions, we can show that not just the NFAT is affected, but also IL-2 production. Here you can see the dose-dependent inhibition of, uh, uh, of IL-2 production by CBGA. Uh, and this is done at, a, at an IC50 or 4.5 micromolar. So does this also apply to in vivo? And what we try to do is uh, test this out in a system where we know that there's a massive inflammatory response, and that is with cisplatin. So anybody who undergoes cancer treatment and is treated with cisplatin will know that uh, the rate limiting or the, the, the disease limiting application of cisplatin is really based on its uh, nephrotoxicity. So it's very toxic to the kidney. And that is in part due to uh, the massive inflammation caused by this molecule. And what you can see here, uh, these are all pro-inflammatory molecules uh, that are released in response to the injection of 
uh, cisplatin into the peritoneal cavity of a mouse. And what is happening here is there's a massive increase in IL-2 production due to the T cells. There's a massive uh, increase in IGM-1, in IL-6, and TNF-alpha. All of the blue bars, you can see there's a significant increase in pro-inflammatory mediators. MCP-1, endothelin-1, CXCL-10. CRP is not as strongly uh, modulated by cisplatin, but here it is. And interestingly, if we use CBGA, it really inhibits the production of these pro-inflammatory mediators. The red bars show you it brings it back to normal in most cases here, here, and here. So injecting the molecule into the peritoneal cavity really uh, triggers uh, a response that inhibits uh, the pro-inflammatory effect of cisplatin. And we are hopeful that we may be that maybe we can use CBGA uh, in, uh, in ameliorating the effect of cisplatin. Uh, and I don't have the time to go into this. We just published this uh, a couple of weeks ago. CBGA ameliorates inflammation and fibrosis in acute and chronic kidney disease. Uh, it's a beautiful study by Sayuri Suzuki in, in, in our lab. And uh, I would encourage you to take a look at that paper. It's, it's, it's something that holds great promise for us to see whether that could be uh, something that could be co-applied with, say, uh, cisplatin um, and ameliorate uh, the, the, the kidney toxicity uh, in, in cancer treatments. So in summary, uh, I have shown to you that cannabinoids inhibit store-operated calcium entry in immune cells. Uh, and the mechanism is the block of crack channels, store operated calcium entry channels, <coughs> uh, uh, in the highest potency by CBGA, but others are also potent, CBNA, THCA, and CBDA. And this causes inhibition of NFAT activation and IL-2 production. So it will reduce the pro-inflammatory cytokine production in uh, T cells and mast cells. The challenge that we're facing is that CBGA, is that CBGA binds strongly to serum BSA. And we're working on this uh, by developing appropriate um, formulations to hopefully uh, 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 improve that situation. We find that there are mild entourage effects. So eight of the molecules, cannabinoids are additive, four are supra additive and eight are sub additive. We think that the significantly uh, the significantly different potencies that we observe in various immunocytes uh, may uh, account for the entourage effects that uh, people observe with with the whole extract as compared to individual cannabinoids. So, as I said, we are new to this field. We have uh, developed uh, this particular uh, screening uh, uh, process uh, and found some beautiful effects. In the meantime, we have uh, also done additional molecules and some of them are active in other molecules, but this will have to wait for maybe another seminar next year. Uh, so we're hopeful that if we are uh, continuing to systematically study the effects of all of these cannabinoids and other molecules uh, in combination with them uh, may lead to a better understanding of how inflammation can be modulated and uh, uh, leveraged to treat human disease. Uh, these are the people who have done the work. Uh, this is Andrea Flight, my long-term collaborator uh, in, in all sorts of ion channels. Malika Fauzi, uh, Sayuri Suzuki, Clay Wakano, uh, John Starkus, Ivana Piljewa, Brandon Johns, and Aaron Collin, Mahelani, Alex. All of them have contributed different essays to this particular study. Uh, and we are working uh, with uh, folks uh, at the University of Bloomington and Indiana, Ken Mackey and Mikhaila Dvorakova on, on pain models where we are trying to uh, use these molecules to see whether we can inhibit inflammatory or neuropathic pain. And with this, I thank you for your attention and I'm open to questions.
Okay, um, Dr. Penner. Uh, first question was from, well, both questions from Dr. Schurer. Uh, Dr. Penner, great research. Do you think there's a potential for complex cannabinoid, uh, excuse me, cannabinoid assays to exhibit? Sorry, what was that? I, I did not quite get the question. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Penner, great research. Do you think there is potential for complex cannabinoid assets to exhibit? We do think that there is. Uh, uh, if 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 we are modifying the the molecules, or uh, I assume that what complex means that we are um, using possibly. Uh, uh, and in the chat, I think it's, it's it says magnesium or, or zinc. I think that is a possibility. Uh, I can I can tell you that we are working with uh, with a company right now uh, that uh, hopefully will give us some uh, excipients that could be used. These are not magnesium or zinc base, but that would be interesting. And that would be a nice collaboration if somebody is interested in collaborating with, <clears throat> with us on this. But we're working on gold-based molecules to see whether that works. Um, the, this is something that we will have to, to await. So we have no data on, on, uh, on complex uh, molecules, but it will be interesting to look at that. So. Uh, if Dr. Scherer is interested in uh, uh, in exploring this further with us, please please contact me. Uh, we are very interested in in learning from from other molecules that that could hopefully uh, provide a better bioavailability than CBGA. So, so Dr. Scherer has one more question. He's like activity, e.g., mg, CBDA, right? Uh, two or are... ZN, CB. CBDA yes. too. Go, go ahead, sir. Yes. What he means is uh, these are uh, these are magnesium complexes or zinc complexes of CBDA in this case. Uh, we don't know. Uh, it will be very interesting to see if 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 those molecules uh, have uh, a lower, uh, for example, serum binding. Whether they improve bioavailability. These are things that we can easily test. We have actually developed a, a screen. Uh, I, I'm not prepared yet to uh, to disclose how the other cannabinoids are affected by uh, the 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 serum binding. Obviously, we do know that cannabinoids can have biological effects. It's not like everything is absorbed by serum. We do know that delta nine THC, for example, causes psychoactive effects. We know that CBD, for example has some effect on, on epilepsy, but uh, we think that many of the molecules will have issues, particularly the acidic ones, uh, with bioavailability. And that is a challenge that we have to solve by creating appropriate modifications of, of the cannabinoids or uh, create appropriate formulations. And we're trying to pursue both of those avenues. Okay, I guess that concludes it. Thank you, Dr. Penner. You were excellent during this, this webinar. We really appreciate your service on this, sir. All right. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>